Hello, my name is Jennifer Cozart. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon at Texas Heart Institute. I want to thank Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center for inviting me to speak today. I'll be speaking about atrial fibrillation and the surgical management options of this common disease, specifically about new approaches for surgical treatment of refractory or long-standing AFib. I have no disclosures. So atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac arrhythmia, affecting more than 33 million individuals worldwide, and in the U.S., over 3 million people um, have atrial fibrillation. It's associated with increased risk of thromboembolic events like stroke, peripheral ischemia, also increased mortality and reduced quality of life. Um, AFib is known to increase the risk of stroke by an average of five-fold, um, and it's also linked to an increased risk of sudden death. Persistent atrial fibrillation is often a treatment challenge due to the electrical and anatomic differences among different patients. There can be variability in the scar burden and location uh, of origin and also left atrial enlargement and patients often have other comorbidities as well. This is a busy slide, but just briefly showing that there are many different mechanisms for atrial fibrillation. It's a heterogeneous disease and can have a variety of different electrical abnormalities. Uh, there can be single or mo multiple foci of abnormality, also multiple re-entrant circuit circuits or wavelets. Uh, the majority of these abnormalities are found in the left atrium and also near the pulmonary veins, uh, but they can arise in other areas of the heart as well. Um, there are several different types of AFib I want to quickly define, um, mostly uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is AFib that resolves within seven days of onfit, onset, and non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which consists of persistent atrial fibrillation, which is continuous AFib, sustained more than seven days, and long-standing persistent AFib, uh, which is AFib that is continuous for more than 12 months. Now I'll get into the treatments for atrial fibrillation. Um, medications are typically first-line treatment. I won't go over that, but antiarrhythmics, anticoagulants, and rate control drug drugs are often used in combination. Um, most procedures for atrial fibrillation target treatment of the left atrial wall because, as I said uh, earlier, it's a critical part of initiating and maintaining persistent atrial fibrillation. Uh, some procedures also target the right atrium as well. Um, endocardial ablation is done by uh, electrophysiologists uh, and is somewhat effective, but it can be difficult to treat patients with persistent or long-standing atrial fibrillation uh, with this technique alone. Um, it usually requires uh, repeat ablations for good results, and um, uh, multiple ablations can lead to the dreaded complication of esophageal uh, or phrenic injury. The techniques I'll cover more uh, are surgical in nature. Um, surgery is obviously invasive treatment, um, and it does involve prolonged recovery compared to endocardial ablation alone. Uh, the Cox maze procedure is still the gold standard of surgical treatment for atrial fibrillation. Um, it can be technically challenging and complex. It does require cardiopulmonary bypass, um, which endocardial treatment alone does not. Um, it can be done through an open sternotomy or through minimal access surgery. Um, and it has a very high success rate, uh, quoted from 85 to 95% freedom from AFib long term. Other techniques are the mini maze, which is a mix of different approaches and lesions, uh, pulmonary vein isolation, which uh, only treats part of the left atrial wall. Um, and part of the problem in physicians really knowing uh, the real clinical results of AFib surgery is that when a patient does have surgery, um, the ablation techniques or patterns that are actually used in surgery can be very different going all the way from a full Cox maze to just pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, the convergent procedure or the hybrid approach is a newer technique, uh, which I'll go over more uh, in depth. Um, it's a multidisciplinary approach that combines both endocardial and epicardial ablation, and it provides maximal treatment of the left atrial tissue. Um, um, closure of the left atrial appendage is also very important uh, in the treatment of atrial fibrillation, and this can be done either concomitant with other surgery or even as a standalone procedure. So, when should you call a surgeon uh, for treatment of atrial fibrillation? Um, there are two major categories for consideration of surgical uh, ablation for atrial fibrillation. Number one is if a patient has AFib and other concomitant cardiac abnormalities requiring surgery, like if they have a valve uh, problem requiring valve surgery or coronary bypass, um, all patients with symptomatic AFib should be considered for surgical ablation at the time of concomitant surgery. 
Um, of course, if a patient has a reasonable risk and uh, the ablation doesn't significantly lengthen the time of cardiopulmonary bypass or increase the risk of the surgery. Uh, number two, if a patient has atrial fibrillation without any other concomitant uh, cardiac problems, uh, a standalone surgical ablation should be considered uh, for patients if they have either failed medical therapy, if they have persistent AFib after failed endocardial ablation, if they have long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, either with or without a prior ablation, um, you can consider hybrid ablation uh, or the convergent approach, uh, either open uh, or standard open or minimally invasive maze for any of these patients. Okay, so for a patient with atrial fibrillation and endocardial or left atrial appendage thrombus, um, surgical approach uh, should be considered um, because endocardial approaches alone, like the watchman, is contraindicated due the, to the high risk of embolization with a, a known thrombus. Um, also, if a patient has a contraindication for anticoagulation, like a GI bleed, hemorrhagic stroke, uh, or other uh, bleeding problems, a standalone epicardial left atrial appendage closure um, can be considered uh, as a standalone. Atroclip can be done, uh, and uh, this does give excellent closure of the left atrial appendage and significantly reduces stroke risk. Um, if a patient has a very large uh, left atrium, uh, treatment with uh, endocardial ablations alone um, is known to be uh, minimally effective, and so surgery can be uh, considered in these patients. So um, this diagram shows the classic cut and sew Cox maze three procedure, which is the basis of all the ablations for atrial fibrillation, uh, which, uh, and I wanna go through this just to kind of uh, give a, uh, kind of lay the groundwork of uh, all the other treatments to come. Um, surgical treatment of AFib was first performed over 25 years ago by Dr. James Cox in 1987 in St. Louis. Uh, since then, the full Cox maze lesion set has proved to be highly effective and result in a high cure rate for AFib. The maze pattern of lesions was chosen to prevent multiple erratic impulses from propagating to cause AFib, but also leaving behind the ability of activating both atria um, uh, and creating a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, this technique involved making multiple left and right atrial incisions uh, that when they were closed, formed a set of scars which isolated the pulmonary veins and posterior left atrium, uh, as well as the right atrium. These lesions are, are meant to direct the sinus impulse from the SA node to the AV node along a specified route, and in theory allows coordinated electrical activation of the entire atrial myocardium. This Cox maze three uh, procedure, as I said, is the base of, basis of all subsequent minimally invasive approaches and also um, endovascular approaches. So this shows the lesions for the Cox maze four, um, which is um, a later iteration of the Cox maze three. It uses as it uses a combination of incisions and alternate energy sources like bipolar radio frequency and cryoablation, which are shown here to the right. Uh, to complete the full lesion set instead of all um, incisions. This makes for an easier, quicker, and safer operation, um, but with the same end goal um, of the Cox Maze 3. Uh, the Cox Maze 4 can be performed uh, through an open chest or also minimally invasive, uh, but it does require cardiopulmonary bypass and cardio cardiac arrest. Um, this can be done alone uh, or with other cardiac procedures as well. Uh, so the key components of a proper maze procedure is isolation of the pulmonary veins and isolation of the posterior left atrium or the box lesion, um, excision or closure of the left atrial appendage, and uh, isolation of the right atrium. Uh, this shows the uh, Cox maze 4 technique, um, which uh, this represents an open uh, sternotomy approach with bicable cannulation. Uh, on the left of the screen, you can see the right atrial lesion sets. This portion can be done um, uh, with a beating heart. On the right, uh, the left atrial lesion set does require um, uh, cardiac arrest. Um, this is just a representation of the Cox maze 4, which can also be performed uh, minimally invasive with femoral cannulation uh, through a right mini thoracotomy uh, submammary incision. Dr. Damiato et al. Uh, did a review of the Cox maze 3 and Cox maze 4 studies in 2017 comparing 
uh, both of these treatments for atrial fibrillation. Uh, the Cox Maze 4 has proven to have similar results at one year. Um, however, there, they did show lower results at five years compared to the Cox Maze 3. Um, this could be due to different follow-up methods, um, uh, but uh, overall the Cox Maze 4 uh, in most literature still has excellent long-term results and is still considered the, the current gold standard treatment for treatment of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I want to mention consideration of atrial fibrillation at the time of concomitant surgery, which is very important and should never be overlooked. Uh, in uh, patients undergoing cardio coronary bypass or aortic valve replacement patients with non-paroxysmal AFib, um, it is still considered the best option to perform a maze procedure at the time of surgery, uh, which can offer close to 90% reduction of atrial fibrillation, and it also adds stroke protection. Um, if a pulmonary vein isolation uh, is done alone uh, with a left atrial clip, uh, that only provides about 30% uh, improvement of atrial fibrillation and stroke protection. Um, at a very minimum, uh, uh, in addition to concomitant surgery, a left atrial uh, appendage clip or closure uh, uh, does provide stroke protection and gives about a 10% reduction in atrial fibrillation. Similarly, patients undergoing mitral uh, valve surgery um, should be considered for a full Cox maze procedure. Um, during mitral surgery, the atrium is opened anyway, and therefore, um, if uh, the patient's a, an acceptable risk, a full Cox maze is still the best way to prevent atrial fibrillation. At very minimum, again, uh, the left atrial appendage clip is easy to perform, uh, doesn't in increase any significant uh, operative time, and gives stroke protection. The newest treatment option for refractory atrial fibrillation is the convergent procedure, which is a hybrid approach to atrial fibrillation. It's a team effort of both an electrophysiologist and a cardiac surgeon. It consists of two procedures that are staged four to six weeks apart. The first part is a surgical or epicardial ablation, um, and you can include uh, the left atrial appendage closure at the same time. The second part is the endocardial mapping by uh, the electrocardiologist uh, and uh, endocardial ablation at that time. This is a staged approach um, which is preferred to give the epicardial lesions from surgery time to heal and scar um, so that leads to a more accurate endocardial mapping and limits the need for extensive endocardial ablation at the second procedure. There are two targeted patient groups for the convergent ablation, um, those with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation or AFib more than a year, and those who have persistent atrial fibrillation uh, with recurrence after failed endocardial ablation. The ideal convergent patient would be one uh, with long-standing persistent AFib, uh, two or less prior endocardial ablations, however, they can have more. Um, no prior cardiothoracic surgery uh, and uh, a low or normal uh, cardiac risk for surgical intervention. Contraindications to the convergent are patients with prior uh, cardiac surgery. Um, if they need concomitant surgery, that should be done uh, through a surgical open approach. Um, if they have a history of chest radiation or pericarditis, they should not uh, undergo convergent. In the spring of 2021, the Episense device by Atricure was approved by the FDA for treatment of long-standing persistent AFib uh, with a convergent approach. The Converge trial demonstrated superiority of the hybrid AF therapy compared to endocardial catheter ablation alone, and I'll discuss this further. But first, I'll describe how the convergent approach is performed. Convergent AFib ablation begins with a surgical procedure. Transesophageal echocardiogram uh, is used first to rule out left atrial throm thrombus. If a thrombus uh, in the left atrial appendage or the atrium is present, then the case is aborted due to the risk of embolization and stroke. If the heart's clear, then we proceed. A sub xiphoid pericardial window is then performed and cannulation uh, with a thoracoscope is placed into the posterior pericardium. This diagram shows the Episense coagulation device that's used for convergent ablation. It's a radio frequency device that creates a three centimeter linear ablation line. Vacuum suction is used to pull the tissue into the device for engagement. And the field is filled with saline to cool the temperature of the surrounding tissue. This video shows the surgical procedure. The sub xiphoid incision is made and the cannula with the camera and Episense device is inserted into the posterior pericardium. The Episense device is then used to create multiple linear ablation lines to completely cover the posterior left atrial wall between the pulmonary veins. This recreates um, the box lesion from the Cox maze procedure. 
Uh, one benefit of this epicardial ablation approach is that the ablation energy is directed away from the esophagus and directly toward the heart, which further decreases the chance of esophageal injury. For the second stage of the convergent approach, which is usually four to six weeks after surgical ablation, endocardial mapping and catheter ablation is done to treat any gaps in the ablation lines or areas that are not able to be reached with the epicardial approach. Uh, this is typically on the roof line or even near the pulmonary veins. This diagram shows a completed lesion set of the convergent approach. Uh, the blue epicardial lesions uh, are shown here and the red is the endocardial lesions uh, uh, performed during the second stage. The goal is uh, AFib substrate reduction or debulking of the tissue that causes AFib. The entire posterior left atrial wall should be ablated and the pulmonary veins are completely isolated. The end result is the equivalent to the box lesion set from the Cox maze procedure. Um, complications uh, can include esophageal injury. Um, we do uh, monitor the, the esophageal temperature throughout the procedure. Pericarditis uh, or pericardial effusion uh, is also um, something that we try to prevent post-op uh, because it's a known complication and we provide steroids, colchicine, um, indocin, diuretics, uh, and we also uh, do surveillance with an echo um, prior to discharge and also two to three weeks post-op is recommended. Um, in March of 2021, uh, the Converge trial was uh, published, and this was a prospective multicenter randomized clinical trial that demonstrated improved effectiveness of the hybrid convergent procedure over endocardial ablation alone. The primary effectiveness was freedom from AFib uh, through 12 months, and the hybrid convergent procedure showed superior effectiveness compared to endocardial only ablation in patients with advanced atrial fibrillation. Uh, it showed that a heart team approach helps improve outcomes in patients with advanced AFib. Uh, the Converge trial was conducted at 27 sites in the US and UK and studied 153 patients with drug refractory, symptomatic, persistent, and long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, the patients were randomized two to one into the hybrid convergent arm and endocardial catheter ablation alone. Of note, the endocardial ablations were in the study were performed only with radiofrequency catheters and no cryoablation. Um, also uh, in this study, the left atrial appendage was not addressed and was not closed by any te technique. So um, the converged trial imposed no limits on the duration of AFib and also allowed patients with substantial left atrial dilation uh, to be included. Uh, so it's the only ablation trial to include uh, these patients. Um, the long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation sub-analysis showed excellent results and led to the FDA label for treatment of long-standing persistent atrial, fibrilla atrial fibrillation with this technique. A total of 42% of patients in the trial had long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, and I'll get to these results. Uh, baseline characteristics were similar in each arm. AFib duration was on average close to six years, and um, the left atrial size uh, was approximately four centimeters or greater. Follow-up uh, for this study was done uh, at six and 12 months with a 24-hour Holter monitor and at 18 months with a seven-day Holter monitor. Uh, the results showed uh, freedom from atrial arrhythmia with or without antiarrhythmic drugs was significantly higher, approximately 20% 20 20 better uh, with the convergent approach versus endocardial ablation alone, and these results were sustained at 18 months. Freedom from AFib and at least a 90% AFib burden reduction was significantly higher with a convergent uh, procedure versus endocardial ablation alone. Uh, these again were sustained through 18 months. The left diagram shows that 71% of patients in the hybrid group had AFib or, or had free freedom from AFib at 12 months compared to about 51% of patients with catheter ablation. At 18 months, uh, these results were sustained. The convergent patients also had a significant improvement uh, of up to 71% of all AFib symptoms and freedom from cardioversion compared to 41% for endocardial ablation patients alone at 12 months. The convergent approach, approach was proven to be safe. Uh, there were no deaths and one pericardial effusion, one stroke, and a temporary phrenic nerve injury. These primary safety events were not reported in the endocardial ablation arm. So in conclusion, there were superior outcomes with a hybrid convergent procedure compared to endocardial catheter ablation alone in those with drug refractory long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, and these results were sustained at 18 months.
there was a, an acceptable safety profile and it shows that a collaborative heart team approach improves outcomes in patients that are difficult to treat with long-standing AFib. Uh, the Convergent Plus approach, which is what I personally perform at Texas Heart Institute and uh, a lot of centers are now going, going to, uh, produces further optimization of the hybrid treatment to reduce stroke risk by closing the left atrial appendage uh, and it provides more AFib burden reduction. Uh, it includes the previously described epicardial ablation uh, and the second endocardial ablation of the conversion approach, but it adds a left thoracoscopy and epicardial closure of the left atrial appendage, typically with an, a clip, uh, division of the lig ligament of Marshall, and additional ablation lines uh, on the roof of the left atrium and also at the uh, anterior to the left pulmonary veins and at the base of, appen of the appendage can also be added. Uh, these basically just add uh, more improvement of uh, freedom from AFib and stroke. Closure of the left atrial appendage is also important because it's often a trigger site for atrial fibrillation and a source of thrombus formation and stroke. Uh, left atrial appendage closure should be an integral part of any AFib treatment. There are several methods for, for this. I'll talk about the surgical closure. Um, uh, this, uh, these pictures show the atroclip, which is an epicardial surgical placement uh, uh, of a clip at the base of the appendage uh, for complete closure of the appendage. Uh, over 300,000 atroclip devices uh, have been used and it's very safe, effective, and uh, easy to use. Um, these images just show uh, a left thoracoscopic uh, view uh, of the left chest. Uh, here we're looking at the the pericardium and you can see uh, we make a pericardial window or opening in the pericardium just posterior to the phrenic nerve. Um, after you get into the pericardium, uh, the left atrial appendage is seen and can usually be um, uh, brought out into the pleural space through the pericardial opening. And uh, on the right it shows the um, atroclip after deployment at the base of the appendage. Uh, we also use transesophageal echocardiogram at the time of surgery to ensure that the left atrial appendage is completely closed. Um, closing the appendage is known to downregulate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, also reduce arrhythmia burden, and most significantly uh, reducing the risk of stroke and systemic thromboembolization. Um, the LAOS-3 study, um, part of that looked at the left atrial appendage occlusion during cardiac surgery to prevent stroke, and it was published in the New England Journal in June of 2021. It was a multi-center randomized controlled trial involving patients with AFib and those that had a chads vast score of at least two. Um, a higher score here indicates a greater risk for stroke. Um, this study looked at over 4,000 patients. Uh, over 2,000 were in both the surgical occlusion uh, arm and uh, also uh, or, and the other arm were those who did not have uh, occlusion of the left atrial appendage. Uh, the patients underwent cardiac surgery for other indications and were randomly assigned to either um, occlusion of the left atrial appendage or no occlusion. The primary outcome showed occurrence of ischemic stroke and systemic embolization were significantly reduced. Um, at 3.8 years, the surgical um, appendage occlusion arm had about 4.8% events compared to 7% in the group that had no closure of the appendage. So in conclusion, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation can and be successfully and safely treated with a convergent plus hybrid approach. Um, you should always consider surgical ablation, um, which the gold standard is the Cox Maze 4 procedure, uh, and left atrial appendage closure during concomitant cardiac surgery in patients with AFib or as a standalone procedure when it's indicated. Uh, a team approach is, is an excellent way to optimize the treatment and reduce the complications associated with atrial fibrillation. So when managing your patients with atrial fibrillation, don't forget that surgical treatment remains a vital part of the optimal management of AFib, and we're always here to help. Uh, I want to sincerely thank the Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center for the opportunity to speak with you today about surgical treatment for atrial fibrillation. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.